Welcome to another episode of Anything Goes James English Show. And today's guest, we've got the lovely Brad Welsh. How are we, brother? Very good, James. Very nice to meet you and welcome to our beautiful city of Edinburgh. Thanks for having me, mate. It's okay, mate. Like I say, I don't sit with any questions, Brad, so it's a case that we just roll with it. Obviously, a bit of your background. You grew up in a tough house in a scheme. Um, turned boxing very... F you turned bo boxing for what? Seven, eight? Seven year old, yeah. Aye. Aye. Um, my energies. You became Edinburgh casual. Started your own stuff, kind of stuff with Edinburgh stuff. And then, in the prison, a couple of things, but the stuff that you're doing now, I think is phenomenal. All the stuff mm -hmm. with the kids, people come to your boxing gym. I think it's brilliant what you're doing to make changes in other people's life. Yeah. So we'll go right back to the Brad, uh, start, Brad, where it all started for you, where you kind of grew up and where it kind of led you in life. Well, I think, James, that my, my story can be um, related to where many people will be watching your podcast, yeah? We're all young laddies for the street, James, aren't we? I mean, that's mm -hmm. gone back 35, 40 years ago. That's where we were brought up, housing schemes. You know, it was like Edinburgh, Edinburgh and Glasgow had city centres, but the vast majority of people were born in housing schemes, weren't they? And back then, there were good places, there were places of fully community, you know, so I'm thankful that I was brought up there. And it did shape me, I suppose, James, that we all are, everybody, are the people we are because of our past experiences, mm -hmm. aren't we? So being brought up in that housing scheme, yeah, it did shape me and stuff like that. It was a, an area in Edinburgh called Moulton, and it's on the south of Edinburgh. It's next to Craig Muller and Lindgren. These were areas that were... They had the, the house to boom after the war and stuff like that. They were be, sh be shabby uh, prefabs that were built, yeah. So I was born there to uh, my mum, Patricia, and my, my father, um, Tony, and I had a brother, Sean, yeah. So we were brought up there, age of seven year old. Um, it's just basically the time that I can remember being there, yeah. Can't, for some reason, I don't know if it's because of all the punches to the head, James. Mm -hmm. As a boxer, I can't even remember past that. But at seven year old, there was, I, there were my sort of formation years uh, being brought up and um, got involved in boxing for yeah. More than still to this day, it's a very, very rough place. Um, socially and economically alienated because of where it is. I mean, there's no frontline service there. I'm quite proud that I've already came full circle that I'm actually back in that area now and I'm actually providing services for that area for the kids and stuff, yeah. I think it's brilliant. And what age did you start getting into boxing, Brad? I think at seven years old, my, my brother, Sean, um, he took me to uh, Meadowbank Stadium and um, he actually took me to Karate because he went to Karate. My mum was very keen to get me involved. At that time, at seven year old, uh, my parents' relationship had um, dismantled you. And my mum basically kicked my dad out. So I was brought up by a single parent with my mum. And she thought it'd be a good way for my energy. I've always been full of energy, James. So she wanted to get me into boxing. Mm -hmm. So at seven year old, I went to Meadowbank Stadium. Mm -hmm. So obviously the boxing, you, you kind of learn how to handle yourself. I watched a few of your videos. I think you were only nine, 10 punching the bag about. You were unbelievable then. I brought, you had some, you had a great talent. I don't know about that. I think as a young kid, young, Young kids that take up sport, they often show good talent, yeah. Mm -hmm. They often show, you know, a, a natural sort of ability to, to, you know, to be, to play sport, yeah. I just think boxing was something that I, I focused on and I did like hitting things, yeah. Mm -hmm. I like hitting things. And I suppose I was a part of that. No, looking back now, at the age of seven years old, you never rationalised that you were doing that for a reason. But there's no doubt about that in my adulthood, looking back, James, that I used boxing, even at seven years old, as a vehicle to channel my energies and not to think about what was going on in family life, yeah. Aye, because like I say, when you're brought up in that environment, it can be tough. We can channel that through whether it's sitting in a room or whether it's violence because we feel more, a wee bit more important. Well, of course, yeah, and that's it. There's no doubt about that. Playing sport, and it's the reason why I use it now as a medium to engage with kids. Is it because you get endorphins from it, you're focused on it, you know? So, and yeah, I suppose, but back then again, it's a different epoch of your time, wasn't it? You've got to remember the communities back then, even though they were very community-led, there was nothing in them. Because mm -hmm. you know? you're very well respected in Edinburgh. Like I say, we've all done wrong in life, including myself, but we're trying to rectify that now with doing good things. When you started getting into like, the fights and you realised you could handle yourself, did you, was it, because I think you, you said you had two, three hundred fights by the time you were 12 or 13? No, I had about 200 fights by the time I was about 13, yeah. And that was because back then boxing was a flourishing sport. And it was only one of the mediums that, you know, people could have either played football or you boxed eh? or you mm -hmm. played music or they listened to music. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the sport was very, very well attended and you'd have maybe two or three contests a week. You could. Mm -hmm. You know, you go to championships, you've boxed six or seven times. So I, I used boxing as a vehicle and it's only now, I didn't realise it then, but I did. It was the way that I showed my self-esteem, yeah? And all, all young kids selling the ghettos in the area, yeah, were thrived to, to try and express their self-esteem. Some did it through their music, some did it through their clothing. I done it through with my hands, probably. Do you think if you never had the box in your life, it'd be totally different from where you are now? Most definitely, but that's a great in hindsight, isn't it? Because it, normally it's the Ali Graziano story, we call it, that boxing saved a young kid for going down the wrong path. Well, I'm a little bit different for that because I did have boxing right up to the age of 17, 16, 17, but at the same time, 
James Edwards was having a dual life, yeah, because he's a young kid being brought up in there. And, and I realise now that, that through the media, I mean, me being very good at boxing as a young kid, yeah, just to clarify, because I wasn't that good later on, but as a, I was a wee child sort of prodigy. I was that good when I was younger and winning everything and stuff. And it, that, that created a self-esteem in me, which then I transferred into the environment that I was in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nobody being a bully, because I can quite categorically say that I've never been that, and anybody that knows me knows that, yeah. But at the age of seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, well, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, through my school and, and into my, my teenage years, I developed a reputation on the streets of Edinburgh as um, being involved in sort of gang culture. Mm -hmm. But like I say, the gang kind of culture is for a wee bit of acceptance as well because you feel as if your pals kind of love you and if there's a broken home, uh, you're not feeling oh. getting that love inside the house. It's easy to get in the gang culture, but you feel accepted when you're doing daft shit, you're all laughing joke. We all know when we mention Hibs, your name, all, your your name's associated with Hibs, Brad Welsh. You know that yourself. Well, that, how I mean, how did the, how did you get into that? Well, I think when you were talking about that, it's not just this is not just unique to the city of Edinburgh. And for the first time the, since the mod generation, you know, in the seventies and stuff, you had like a new gang culture, didn't you? You had a new expose a UK culture, which was the casual scene. Yeah, which you called it the casual scene, mm -hmm. and that was just basically groups of young kids getting behind a new movement, and the movement was fashion led. And it was also, it was sport led because youngsters at that age, what other medium, what other outlets did they have to go and have entertainment? You went to the football. Right? And that was always, always been trouble at football matches. But this new, this new expose of, should I say, culture was became around a casual scene, yeah? And I was just there at that time. I wasn't the leader behind it. I wasn't the person that made it. This just evolved, yeah? It evolved not just in Edinburgh, but in Glasgow, Aberdeen, Dundee, all over. And there's this new casual culture, which I was, Quite fortunate, actually, James. I'll say that. I'm quite proud to say that. I've actually had the experiences of being a, a young boy being brought up with something that's real, as opposed to young kids today who are so about social media and there's no life experiences there for them. Mm. We were brought up in a generation in the 80s, early 80s, where you go to football with your mates, living, yeah? I mean, remember, this was born out of frustration, born out of Thatcher society. You know, when you lived brought up in the ghettos and there was fuck all there. What did you do? Dress yourself up in nice clothes and go and belong with your pals and have a laugh. But for the first time ever, and as you'll appreciate being a man from Glasgow, there's always been gang culture. Always. Oh, and I think it'll always, but, be, it'll always be there to the day we die. But for the first time ever, what you had in Scotland is you had a unique set of circumstances where gang culture now became an international thing. So you now had city versus city. And that's really what's quite unique about it. I mean, I'm not proud of the levels of violence and stuff. I mean, as you probably know for me now, James, that you know, I'm anti-violence. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a poacher turned gamekeeper and that's what I preach to all the kids and stuff. But I'm, I also realise that the person I am is made through the experiences that I've had. Mm. So I've no, no problem with going back and thinking about that and looking at it objectively now. So again, back to that, I got behind, I was always a boxer and that's what, that's what I've done, winning championships and titles and stuff as a very young kid. And then I got involved with my brother, we got into football, but I was one of the younger ones. I was only like 13 years old. But I would take the, the, the stuff that I'd learn in gymnasiums and I'd use that on front lines. Yeah. Mm. So I built up a bit of reputation around Scotland with people with different more because again you had it wasn't just teams, it was now city versus city. So for Aberdeen, Glasgow, Aberdeen, Dundee, everybody knew who everybody was, yeah. You were the main player for. Uh -huh. Cause I know you've got a big association with Hibs, but again, you weren't in that culture very long either, were you? No, I wasn't actually. That's the thing about it. I was thirteen year old stuff when I went into it and again, it was a, they were great times because you remember them back, James, to a period of time that was carefree. Mm -hmm. And what you know, and fair enough, what that involved was if you look back as an adult, quite stupid groups of your pals having gang gang violence basically. But it wasn't just about that, it was a commander ship and traveling to other cities and one upmanship, you know, wearing the best clothes and stuff. Mm -hmm. But for me, when I was about and I had a dual, I had three now three lines, I had a boxing line that I was trying to still do, I had this new casual culture, but then also got involved in criminality as well, James. Mm -hmm. yeah? Because and I, I'm looking back now and again, as with hindsight, I'm very aware of that, you know, it'd be People that write books and stuff like that and talk about their past, you know, you date with the brain you've got now. Mm -hmm. So, and I can, that's the only way that I can do it. And looking back now, I can not justify it, but I can explain it. That I was a young lady for the girls and we didn't have much, pal. So, mm -hmm. predaciousness was something that was bred into me because mm -hmm. everybody else had stuff and we never. Aye. And then what that breeds is when you're a young kid, you go off, off track. And they, they father figure there, my brother was basically my father, yeah. And he basically, he was involved in that as well. So, it was a natural progression to go and do that. But I, I also started criminality, James. I started um, organising our young groups and stuff like that. And then, like, I'm not proud to say it, Bob, but like taxing people and stuff like that when I was really young at 13. I uh, was totally wrong. I'm, I'm, I'm embarrassed about that, you know what I mean? But it's partly who I was. And then we went on to obviously organise stuff with smashing grabs and 
stuff like that again. Mm. But again, like I say, everything we've got to thank the past, no matter how far up it is. And like I say, you're your prime example of what you're achieving now. And we can get embarrassed and we can talk about it and go, ah, maybe, but again, that's what lead us to be the men we are today, to help other people to do what we're doing. It's well, no people who don't understand it growing up in a housing scheme, growing up with a single mum, realise how fucking hard it is. And when you've got a path, sometimes we've got to go down that path to make us the person who we are today. So, like I say, I take my hat after you, mate, because we spoke about before this, and you're a visionary, and your plans well, and ideas are massive. I'm, I'm not embarrassed to, to go over the stuff I do. You know, I've, I've, I can deal with that on my phone now. You know, I've got a daughter and stuff like that, and I'm not even, you know, people have came to me and said, write books and stuff like that, and I couldn't have done that because I didn't want to talk about stuff like that. You know, but I do understand that it's a part of who I am, as you said. But, you know, the natural progression for that is when you get onto that kind of path, why I, I'm happy to talk about it, and I'm happy to talk about it under certain circumstances right now, James, that you might not be aware of. And the public may not be aware of it, but I'm currently in a huge fight with a massive media company mm -hmm. called Bauer Media. Right. Over, and they're cash for kids thing. And I've been fighting for about the last three months or along with another group. And this is the kind of stuff that they would like me to talk about so that they can mm -hmm. try and shine a light on me and say, that's what he is. Uh -huh. Don't listen to him. Mm -hmm. But I'm doing that because today I'm speaking about it because I trust you, James. Mm -hmm. yeah? And I trust the people to actually look beyond that mm -hmm. and see that that's who I was and this is who I am now. Mm -hmm. And for a long time in Edinburgh, James, it's been 20 odd years now, I've been doing nothing but good, pal. Mm -hmm. 25 years. But a lot of people didn't want you to shed that, James, did they? They didn't want you to still want you to be, he's this and that. People didn't even know me, mate. And all my life I've been blighted with Brad Welsh, Brad Welsh, mm -hmm. Brad Welsh. Because I was a young boy that was predacious and did get involved in some serious crime. But that is, again, it gives me the ability, unlike other people, to be able to tell kids and to show kids that's not the path to go down. And that's why I've been successful over the last year, because people have well listened to me. Well, listen to what I've got to say because I've experienced that. I'm not a preacher. I'm not like you, James, as well, what you've said. Aye, aye, aye. You've already said that. We're both similar. Mm -hmm. We don't preach to people, mm -hmm. but we do show a different way. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And that's what I've, what I've done. And I'll continue to do that whether people want to view me in some way or another way. Oh, you fuck about that. Aye. But a lot, of, a lot of people who watch, like I say, they'll, they'll take a lot of what you're saying because a lot of people maybe watch a couple of films as well when they go, oh, that's their life and that's what I want to be. We spoke about it. Life of crime or anything you do, you've got two options. Deed or in the jail. That's it. That's it. That is that it. 100% and that brings us there, so this three tracks that I had, I was boxing, boxing at an international level, travelling the world at 14, 15, 16 year old, and I was obviously going out with pals, I was involved in international gang warfare basically, you know, you had to, I was affiliated with a, an organisation called the Capital City Service, the Young Ladies for Edinburgh, and they were very close to that, very tight, and we travelled around the country, travelled over to Europe, and it was great times and stuff like that, look at that, with that mindset, looking back now, pretty silly thing to do, I wouldn't ask anybody or advise anybody to do it, but it was just my school up. Paul. But then I actually, at the same time, jumped into criminality side of things, and that was a path that I wish I'd never went down in hindsight. But it certainly, again, led me, as you say, to here now. That involved James getting involved in quite serious crime, probably, which then into 16, 17, 18, uh, the club scene came around. A lot of people remember that, this is 1988, and you had the dance scene hitting Edinburgh, hitting all over the UK, another expose, and that destroyed the casual culture. Mm -hmm. Casual culture was there, it was about one upmanship, commandership, but then once the sentences started coming in, people were getting jailed for it, you know. It's like it cut out in the middle, and also at the same time it happened that the the cat the dance scene came along. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and that led me into that as well. I was quite well known in Edinburgh and I had a sharp wee brain and stuff like that. And, do you know what I mean? Looking back, I mean as you say I'm embarrassed with some of the stuff that you've done. I mean, it was just pure downright, you know, predaciousness. Horrible. Of name, course yeah. it happens, but what, like I say, we all make mistakes and we all go down that path. But for anybody, what I don't agree with is anybody to throw something in somebody's face that's trying to change their life. Because that for me is a coward. That for me of course. is a shite bag. That for me is a criminal. But that's what that's what these big organisations do. They don't deal with the facts that you bring up. What they do is they try and diversify it and just pour it you to say that's who he is, yeah? Then they listen to him. You know what I mean? I'm used to doing that. But I, but I think a lot more people know you and know who you are as a character. So for that, people reading whatever they see in black and white, it's not going to stick for them because they know that who you are as a character and what you're actually doing in the streets. Like I say, we've spoke about homelessness as well and the stuff you do for the boys. It's, it's brilliant because there's not a lot of people change, Brad. A lot of actions speak louder than words as well. A lot of people talk, they talk, but they don't fucking oh, watch it. That's Which true. is difficult. And that leads, uh, that leads us to where exactly along that timeline. So at 17, 18, I was involved in clubs and protection rackets and firearms and extortion and stuff. Yeah, and I'm not proud of that. Of course I'm not. Mm -hmm. But that to the term, that was what it was. And again, it involves that predacious nature. So I'm a wee bit different from the Ali Graziano story where young boy goes down the wrong path and then turns, you know, you know, keeps him off the right path. I was on the right path and then fell off it. And it was through boxing that I got brought me back on it. So I ended up again, you know, just getting rid of the criminality stuff and 
end up, you know, getting as quite a serious charge, high court trials and stuff like that. Moved into the club scene, shut everybody down, opened up my own places. As a young boy, I was only 18 year old. And then, um, I probably got away with that in Edinburgh. So, so young, did you have anybody above you? Did you have anybody guiding you? Or was that, because no, no. it's, it's such a young age to be running organisations like the ones you're talking about? Well, of course, well, there was people that were partners and stuff like that way. But I mean, it was, you've got to remember that they, when the dance scene came along, you're talking in the city of Edinburgh, there was only 400 people that had caught on to the beat here. This is 1987 and And there was only like one club in Edinburgh called La Belle and Jill, yeah? So, and that was the only club in Edinburgh. So, and I, and I was versed into it. And I, naturally, the, the people that were involved in the casual scene, Jim, they were there like be illuminators, to be trendsetters and stuff like that. That's what started. Mm -hmm. So, that'd be young people that created this new movement, yeah? I mean, the first thought of them, everybody else is walking about wearing their like white cards and stuff like that. The boys were like getting dressed up, stuff like mm -hmm. that, the best gear, bleach jeans, stuff, the best trainers. You know, and again, that thing there, James, I always thought with that, that when the, the casual movement first came about, it was about self-esteem. You know, I the protagonist that was involved in that was about because it's, it's a gesture, isn't it? Look at me, what I'm wearing. Mm -hmm. I'm better than you. It's a mask. That's right. Well, well, and, well, and for me, the, what I tried to be football wasn't really so much that, but was the use of violence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because I was a wee boxer and I was a wee thing, and I was just, I was predacious. There's no doubt about that, you know. Because that obviously made you feel, obviously made you feel important as well. Because people wanted you in their circle, 100%. and Jink, obviously when you had that talent as well, that's why it's such Scotland's like Edinburgh Glasgow. Like, it's tough because when you've got a talent, people leech onto you. But as soon as that talent goes, you're fucking there yourself, and nobody cares. It's hard to. There's no real, any role models to look up to in Glasgow Edinburgh because all these football players and all these people are doing well. They kind of going off a right path, whether it's drink, drugs, gambling. They kind of struggling themselves. It's hard for anybody to really find a role model to really look at and say model image them and become them. It's it's difficult. I think sport plays. Aye. Like that. So when you're um, obviously did the boxing scene. Was there a time you felt like? Was people trying to pull you aside as well? We easily led, or we just made your own mind up well, that. It's me that done it, Jim. Right. Go take full responsibility in your actions, didn't you? Me, I wasn't led by anybody, Paul. It's the, 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 the decisions that I made at that time were, again, born through predaciousness, Paul. It's I've no go, and I'm taking that. Mm -hmm. And that, there's no doubt about that. I went through a high court, high court trial where I could end up with 15 years, I ended up getting four years for, a, for an extortion. Yeah, what age was that? I was, um, it was nine, I was 18. Just on the late, just on the 18, yeah. So, could have been 10, 15 years. The minute I hit that prison cell, Paul, this is the truth. Yeah, and I'm no, I'm no shy to say it or ashamed to say it. I knew it was the for me, mate. Mm. And I'm no big thing. I was a wee guy scutting about with a sharp brain, making things happen. The biggest, hardest guy in Edinburgh and stuff like that. But I had a way to, had a sharp brain, mate, how to connect things together and how to make things happen. With well, the biggest security company in Edinburgh, I had three of the best nights in Edinburgh, making fortunes of money. But I already at that age, it just happened so quick, Paul, that I realised that money was the for me, Paul. Mm -hmm. Or even back then in 1987, 88, I knew that money was there for me. It never interested me, Paul. What did it buy you? Well, it didn't buy you nothing. It didn't mean anything to me. I had my wee mum and stuff, uh, my brother, that was it, I had my pals. And so that was, so the second I hit that, that, that soaked in prison, Paul, I was like, what the fuck, mate? You know what I mean? This is no place to be. What I've jeopardised doing, and that was, in, you know, it was a lot of things, it was a huge big trial, Paul, which could have went wrong, but never, thankfully, touched me and it went right. And so eventually, it, I think one of the charges was an extortion for estate agents. So, and that went me to day four years in prison, Paul. So, and I, I just knew for the second I was in there that I had to get out of there. And the way to do that was to get back on the only thing that I knew was right, was my boxing. Because you said you'd done a lot of reading in there, educated yourself. Yeah, but it was sporting well and just away and just looking back and realising that crime is the way to do things, Paul. I mean, it's, now, again, I say that thinking back. And there's many young kids, I'm not a preacher, Paul. There's many young kids and friends that I've got that are involved in a criminal life. A very high order criminal life, you know, they're getting huge sentences 15 and 20 years. Mm -hmm. For the last 25 years here, James, I've been nothing but just a, 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 a gamekeeper party, mm -hmm. say, people, it's not the way to go. And I have preached that, but I've never done it hugely. I didn't even go and shout, I'm not a preacher. Yeah. Yeah, so. There's no necessarily that we're doing is right either, but it feels right for us, Brian. Oh, it feels right Do for you know me. what I mean? We're doing the right things, and myself being for Glasgow. It's, we can't, you can't preach, it's, everybody's in journey, we've found a wee bit of light where we can go, right? we've found a lane where we feel good, we're doing good, and it, everybody benefits, we're not talking for books, we're talking for experience. experience, we're talking about, we've seen the life of misery, we're talking for dark fucking places, we're talking for your Mark and Martin visiting you in jail, we're talking about them greeting and worried sick about you, but yet, we portray it and jump about with the boys who don't really give a fuck about us anyway, do you it's know what I mean? That's more pertinent now in this day and age because, it's moved forward two generations now and the kind of sentences you're getting are all four years. Mm -hmm. The boys now are coming for, from the areas of Edinburgh, yes, without naming any names. They're only in their 15s and 20s, Paul, for right. stuff they're doing. 
massive drug culture, firearms, very prevalent in Edinburgh, you know, or, or in Scotland. Mm. And that seems to be the new game. And these are, as we spoke earlier, James, these are young boys, 18, 19 year old now, that are international criminals that have got, that, have, that are dealing in four and five in Spain, to Argentina, to, you know, nah, to over Europe, Amsterdam, right. you know, mm -hmm. they're not just dealing in Postal Park, well, aye. you know, the last few Postal are all everywhere. Mm -hmm. Over there, I'll just say that because I know you're from there, aye, aye, aye. It's like, so it's a different game, so it's hard to preach to a young guy. And also, something worth touching on now, you know, I'm not a social saviour, pal, you know what I mean? I'm not like mm -hmm. trying to, try to say, I'm just trying to do my wee bit, which I do through the, which will come to. But the kids that are there now that are not, have they got any choices that now? Because what I see in the communities ahead of me, which I'm sure can be you know, transported to Glasgow, to Aberdeen, Dundee, is that there's no opportunities for kids now. You know, if when you're socially and economically excluded for taking part and stuff in your own community, unless you've got money, mm -hmm. you know, you're, the community centres don't have any services that are free, basically now. You've got to go in and buy your judo or your thing and stuff like that. Everything costs money. So there's no community groups. You know, the, the councils now have been, ripped, had the heart ripped out of them, you know, funding. So they're not putting much on and stuff like that. So would you, would anybody in society now, you know, not expect that kids coming from these communities are going to get involved in crime. Mm -hmm. So when you came out after your sentence, because we, when I was in the sentence, I actually right. used boxing to actually get out. Right. What I done was uh, I started boxing again, and mm -hmm. then I, but while I was in there, I was I actually you had know, a fight for a title fight. I got you know? two. I got released. Actually, I'm laughing back at now. I got took a prison van and taken away to the Glasgow actually to the Manic Hotel. And cuffs. No in cuffs, but in a, in a prison van, dropped off, boxed, won the Western District Championships and taken back again. Then I got taken out two nights later to go and box for Italy, Scotland, Italy, for old Alec Morrison in Glasgow. Yeah, a great guy. Right, shout out Morrison. Uh, shout out Alec Morrison, who was my mentor, yes. Mm -hmm. A great guy, old Alec. And um, he, he um, got taken out in a box against Italy and knocked out the Italian champion in the second round as well. Then 12 weeks after being released to prison, I fought for the British title as an amateur. So I just trained in there. I was a manic trainer as I always did. And so I, I used, stay focused in there though? I used, aye, well it was difficult for a wee guy for England like that mm -hmm. and having all your big bad quest regions trying to mm -hmm. say Brad Welsh, forget <laughs> it. <laughs> still here. <laughs> still in your story. Aye, still here, no, no. So, no, that no, was good. It was educational prison, but we're making light of it. For anybody watching us, prison's no place to be, mate. Big bad boys in there. Aye. Big serious time, you know what I mean? And the boys that are in there, they're doing that, that's their, you know, they're not greeting about it. They're not greeting about it. Maybe worthwhile saying, James, that what I see in the communities in Edinburgh and the kids that are doing that, that are 18, 19, doing huge prison sentences, just my opinion, you know, because I'm close to the ground, I work in these communities, I work with young kids from six year old up to fucking 16 year old, and at gymnasiums, I'm constantly working with people where trying to use boxing as a medium to get them in and get them fit, because if they're fit and they're healthy, their brains are working and the chemical balance is there, they're not taking drugs, they're not getting involved in crime, but it doesn't just work like that, pal, you've got to get kids when they're young, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Again, back to what I was saying, if you, the boys are out there that are doing this, pal, these young lads that are in there, and I know several have got good pals that are in there doing heavy sentences, and I know of many others, the brightest young guys you've ever met in your life. These guys would be, if they went to university, would be running multinational companies. Oh, aye. In fact, they do run multinational companies, because different facets of operations that they're doing mm. are multinational now. And it's like, it's such a shame that that's been the, the pathway for a lot of our brightest young guys. Mm. Good people, and demo who are forced together to then use the law of the jungle. The law of the jungle is violence. Mm -hmm. You only win with violence right. in there. Don't be just being smart. Because the smartest guy you sit there now isn't the guy that's winning now. It's the, it's the guy that's the most violent. Oh, aye. Correct? That's where they get the reputation though. Well, exactly. And that's where you can get power. And that's the wrong thing. But like I say, a lot of these tough men who think they're tough, as soon as they get fucking, that cell door gets shut, a lot of them get end up addicted to the brown, the white, or whatever exactly. it is in there. So, because they can't handle it. So everything is mentally, and like I said, 90% of the people in the jail are, are, dabbling on, are dabbling on something, which is tough as well, because these are good men. Again, everybody, I believe everybody's got goodness in them, everybody's got greatness in them, but it's to channel that. We've been lucky enough to go, right, wait a minute. I was in the drug scene, gambling scene, I was in everything. But for me, I was, I was escaping. I was running away for these in here. I didn't know who I was, because I, I put this persona on for so fucking long that it was just on act. So eventually I didn't know who I was. So you're like an onion, you just wrap yourself around so many layers that you forget who you are. And then luckily enough, I found a lane that I love, I enjoy, and I can do good things for it. Listen, I'm not a fucking saint. I make mistakes every day and there's things I still do and I'm not proud of, but we're human beings. We're going to make mistakes. Do you know what I mean? That's just part and parcel of life. So for all, when you came out, the jail started the boxing. Started boxing. I used I used boxing when I came out on the British title and then from there, I went on an international. I was quite good again. I'd been putting a lot of energy. Let's be clear. When I was 16, 17, 18, I was running on three tracks, criminality track, boxing track, and the casual scene, yeah? Try to juggle it all. Juggling it all, pal. No good. 30% of each of them, yeah? Um, and 
So I'll, I'll do what I, I do regret with the boxing because I never really tested myself, Paul. Mm. When I won the British Town, I was the best I was at and I was decent. But then I was coming out and dealing with all these demons, Paul. I was coming out and dealing with being in a small goldfish bowl in Edinburgh. Brad Wells, Brad Wells, Brad Wells. So what I've done, James, is I uh, travelled the world for about eight months boxing in international competitions, Canada, Turkey, Italy, all over the world, yeah, as an international boxer. And I was like, when I was going to turn pro or no, and I should have went to the Commonwealth Games. I went to the pre Commonwealth Games in Canada. And um, this was in 2004, James, yeah? Mm -hmm. In 1994, sorry, I just was 10 years there. In 1994. And um, I um, went there and I basically watched the style of boxing and it just never suited me. I was stuck in Edinburgh, I was training, I was travelling through Alec Morrison's every day, kind of going through and I, even before I turned pro. And then I made a mistake. I made a mistake of turning professional, I should never have done it. Now, just to be clear, I was a young, good amateur boxer, British champion, was very good. And it wasn't like I was involved in anything else, so just I believe that mentally I, I was in the wrong place to be in Edinburgh. I was getting, trying to get dragged that way, I had no financial income coming in, and I went and turned professional. And I basically boxed seven times away with Alec and stuff like that, won seven contests, and then I, I had to get out of Edinburgh. You know, old Alec was great with me. That's the natural progression of past when you turn for an amateur to a professional. You went with Alec Morrison or Tommy Gilmer. I went with Alec, and I basically used it to get myself over to America, yeah. So what I done was I signed a promotional deal, I arranged my own deal with a company called USC, United Sports Corporation, um, and I basically got them to pay for me to go and live in America. So I went and travelled, I got out of Edinburgh. That was what I wanted to do. Mm. I, wanted to, I wasn't even about boxing. I can honestly say to you, James, and I can be a hand on heart, I didn't love boxing, bro. I didn't love the professional game. your passion. I saw it as, as just a vehicle for me to, and I'm not making excuses, because let's be clear, I wasn't good enough as a pro. Whether that was because I never put the work in or whatever it was, I wasn't good enough. That was it, all right? So, and I'm actually happy at that because at least I've got my faculties about me, stuff like that, and I'm not getting raped of some manager or promoter somewhere, you know me? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm in there punch, getting my face punched on. But we'll come to that in a second. I went to America and I travelled New York, Miami, Detroit, Vegas, and went with all the gymnasiums in America on a, like, a three month trip. And eventually I've ended up staying in Los Angeles with Freddie Roach, who's the world renowned trainer. So, how you been? I was with Angelo Dundee in Miami for a couple of months with my pal. But I got USC to fund it and pay for me as a gentleman that. Made a big success. I thank him, Angus Morrison. He made a huge success at a company with my help because I was a young boy at 14. It's karma, James, isn't it? Mm -hmm. 14 year old, I was telling him what tracks used to buy and what training shoes to buy. And he was putting them in and they were making fortunes of them. So 15 years later, 10 years later, I beat some of the guy again and he becomes my manager sponsor. Sent me to America, lived over there for like a year and a half. Then the boxer had one contest. So I was using the I was using that relationship that I had with somebody in the past and boxing as a vehicle to escape my cell mm -hmm. And I don't realise that now. So I got over to America and I stayed there with Freddie Roach. Um, trained with Andrew Dundee in Miami. Went to Detroit gym as well. Um, and then basically set, set myself in America. I got a nice apartment out over there and they subsidised me and funded me. Eventually did have a contest over there, which I have to tell you about. And um, so I was now basically 9-0 as a pro, yeah? And I boxed a guy called Jesus, yeah? And I find it quite remarkable that I knocked Jesus down twice, but he kept getting back up again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and actually Jesus, and it was just a brawl, mate. And I mean, I don't know what went on there. It was just a pure brawl. I got two public warnings. He got a public warning. He was doing twice, but I lost. Jesus mm -hmm. got the decision. Yeah. So I'm always quite keen to tell people that yeah, yeah I was a yeah. professional. I only lost once to Jesus. Jesus, <laughs> that's a good one, isn't it? So man? came back from there. When I came back and lived in Edinburgh, pal, that was where I sort of went. What we call under the covers. I was lost, James. Yeah? Anybody that knows me back then will know I was a very private person. What age were you then, Brad? I was 25. 25 well, years old. I, I know of other people who always try to get away. Sometimes the grass isn't always greener because the demons oh. were battling up here, doesn't matter where we go. I wasn't so much demon as James. I never had mental health problems. Like I was just, I had this ideology that, and it goes back in the way that my mindset was in as the police in Edinburgh, and I've not touched on that. They planted ammunition on my car, James, you know, when I was a young boy, mm -hmm. and tried to get me done with that, which I never got done with. But they've done that. So I felt that if I was an Edinburgh, I was always a target. So you're always and I was it. always and I wanted to, I just thought it was good sense to escape Edinburgh and not have to deal with any problems that might have arisen for because I was just like, you can things can happen, you know. In case you get stitched up and you're doing a big sentence for it and you're, you're like I just it. felt that, that was the that, that was the way into and also I wanted to get away, I wanted to get away and focus on my boxing, but I realised I didn't love boxing, so I was just chasing my tail pal, you know. Mm -hmm. Came back to Edinburgh, I chat back up here and I done James, what's called is gone under the covers, all right? And I went under the covers for about six years, mate. And I just cut myself off for everything, Paul. Mm -hmm. Even stopped, kind of, was the training sporadically. I had a two contests back here where a good man in Glasgow called Tommy Gilmore. Yeah, but let's face it, my heart wasn't in it and I wasn't good enough. I wasn't good enough. I wasn't like a Josh Taylor 
who are doing everything right for him. And just as a young amateur boxer, I was very good, and I, something probably could have been done with it. But I'm happy and content with myself that you know how things arrive and how they land. I didn't have any misgivings when that came. But I know you say we talk about channels and energies. Do you think if you focused instead of the thirty percent and it hibs are boxing? Or when I was a young boy, if you focused hundred percent. But then I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have been there at the. But we were able to work because they going to prison and because of, you know, dealing with what I was dealing with and coming back here. I'd been feeling frustrated when I was here because it seems like I couldn't move, you know what I mean? I was suffocating. I was I, I mean, but that's why I went to America and it was good that I'd done that. I went to America and I got away from it and sort of myself. But when I came back, it was like I wasn't sort of doing it. And I spent six years, I thought, why, in my bed reading books. Where did you do that six years? Read? Just read and just kept my name coming. I've got good friends and just. And I thought it was great. I didn't have money. I've never chased money, James. I'm not people in the end of got this opinion that I think I've got money. I didn't even, I didn't earn money. Mate. And I've always thought it was a root of evil, pal. You know what I mean? I drank my fucking feet up under. I'm not a Machiavellian character that is involved. And it, how I can explain that, and I know that people get that now, is that even like Lonely and Boulder's greatest, and even like counselor, they give me the keys to like I do huge events, I do like Prince Street Gardens, I show I'm not kind of criminality is something that for that day and in, in, in the in prison. I decided that this is more for me. There's nothing that you can do to earn money that would justify the, the, the ending up here. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I'd rather be with my people. Couldn't buy my wee mum. Couldn't buy my town, my brother, my family, and my nephews. I'm two wee nephews. You know what I mean? So, so for that day, I, I, I turned away from that point. Since then, and that James, that is now for six years after coming out the other end of six years, I basically put my head under the covers for the age of twenty-five to fetch or something like that. Mm -hmm. And that had that broke down relationships with people and stuff like that. You know, it was like, it wasn't like I was dating, I like was doing nothing, James. Mm -hmm. Nothing. Doing absolutely nothing. And then, when I hit 30, I just, um, well, I met a beautiful woman, my, my fiance, yeah? And then it was the other cause that I just, I started clicking back in again, and I just knew that my saviour again would be boxing. Mm -hmm. So I got involved, um, and, I, and, and so, so my, after my 30th birthday, and I would change a sort of environment again in the sense got a new flat stuff where I just put there was the drugs involved there wasn't the thing I've been out partying and drinking and stuff like that you never used to drink mate never used to drink I never touched alcohol until I was 27 year old eh? never been a big um, um, never been a big supporter of anybody that takes drugs and stuff like that yes I've had the occasional wee dabble with stuff like that who's no as a young guy, guy growing up when I was doing that thing but there's never been any problems in my life with mental health or drugs or like that it was just literally that I decided to cut out and just spent a lot of time with myself, mate, you know? And worked on yourself. Aye, and it just like, and then opened up Hollywood Boxing Gymnasium, and this is where things start, and this is 13 years ago, yeah? Because I know we speak about the boxing, and, and like I say, a lot of boys who you know as if they'll no make it, but are kind of getting used in the boxing industry for... You want to touch to, on that? Aye, yeah, mate, to put asses so on seats, aye. I opened, an amateur, seat, I opened an amateur boxing gym to simply to give kids the opportunity to use physical fitness mm -hmm. and boxing training and its tenants to actually better themselves. Mm -hmm. So I didn't open up it in a marginalised dinner called Craig Muller out in the south of Edinburgh, yeah? So that was like 13 years ago, me and a chap, Jimmy Welsh, opened up together. And it wasn't really about finding boxers because I saw the professional. It wasn't me because I wasn't good enough. It was just I saw the way that the professional game was run that's loaded. You've got young kids who have got dreams and aspirations, they turn them professional to then to go and win world titles. But really, they've got managers and promoters who they fuck all for them. Absolutely nothing for them. So it's doing to the individual, and that's what I felt like. I mean, whether it's right or wrong, again, they, they, they fought with the two managed boards. I wasn't good enough, but, you know, back then, there was no, like, training camps, and there was no, like, they, they, they put anything into you, yeah? Mm -hmm. And it's the same now. Young kids now turn on professional. Unless you've got real smarts in your hands, you're, you're going to end up just a ticket seller for people. I believe that, and I see it in Edinburgh, and I see it in Glasgow. Now you've got young kids turning... The, the natural pathway, James, used to be that you served your apprenticeship. There's a magic number in boxing, it's 10. To, be the, to win a Scottish title, 10 years training, four times a week, you win a Scottish title. That's the number that pervades through it. Then you've got 10,000 hours, which to be an outwear, you'd be the best ever, you win a world title, you can put that many hours. Mm -hmm. That'll take you 20 years to get that, 17 years or 16 years. You know, that's the magic number with that. But you've now got young kids turning professional because they're getting offered these ticket deals and they've not even won a Scottish title. The only young kids, if they want to turn professional and go be professional, get an experience and get a lifetime experience in amateur boxing mm -hmm. and travel the world. Because these are the guys that are winning stuff now. Josh Taylor, Lee McGregor, international superstars, winning Britishes, going to the GBs, turning pro, they make it. Young kids, I'm not saying that a kid can't make it, because mm -hmm. you've got desire and you've got... Well, of course, passion. Yeah, you've got passion, yeah, yeah. you're going to do it. You know, there's a lot of good camps in Glasgow now and stuff like that. And there's a lot of good boxers coming for that. But it's just that I see that they're turning pro too early, mate. Mm -hmm. And it was, let's be clear here, 
the professional boxing industry bastardizes the amateur industry. Mm -hmm. The amateur industry is about young kids in, in gymnasiums giving them all with wee trainers. Then what happens is they go to turn pro and they jump over. So it's just like these are just nursery accounts for our business. Mm -hmm. And even these professionals using amateur gyms, it's wrong. And they're getting seriously It's not going to be popular right. you send that to anybody that knows boxing, but it's no fucking right. But it's the truth, but they're going to get seriously injured then as and, well. And there's young kids turning pro now with not even winning Scottish titles, like 10, 12, 14 bouts, stuff like that. Not even winning Scottish, I mean, I'm British and like that. And it's a very hard thing to do. I'm not saying Denny did that because if you're a young guy out there and you're watching this and you're going to do that, you go with what you believe is right. You know what I mean? I'm just saying from what I'm seeing uh, overall. So, Back to Hollywood Boxing, I opened up that 13 years ago and I used to open there as a gymnasium, a gymnasium, not a boxing club. So I started to engage in the community and it's just went, mate, it's went huge. I mean, it's the busiest gym in England by far. But again, we're tenants on this gym. It's not about, it's not important that kids realise their dreams. It's important that they can dream. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And that's it. So for 13 years, we've been there, amateur club, done all the stuff, trained champions, all that. But then I got involved in the event structure as well because I want to be fair for doing that kind of thing. So I took Hollywood Box Gymnasium and I won my box in Scotland to a great organisation. I've got about 120 clubs up and down the country. These are clubs and communities that are offering young kids you know, the opportunity to participate and take part in events and live their dream. If your kid wants to be a boxer, they're going to do it. Yeah, it's about creating the platform for them. Mm -hmm. That's all. Which what you're doing. That's what I've done. done. So that, for that gym there, we've, we've done, but we, what's quite unique, what we've done is we then went on to sort of like huge events and we gave young kids in areas the opportunities to participate in very large scale operation boxing. I mean, we're like huge stuff, big stuff in Europe. Mm -hmm. So for the last five years, we sold at Dusher Hall, which is 2,700 people. Is that that place, the video we showed us? That is, um, that is a phenomenal then, place, isn't it? Better than that, we've done five years ago, just before, well, six years ago, before my mum passed away. My mum passed away five years ago. Sorry to hear that. So, what was her name? Patricia. Patricia, shout out Patricia. So she, um, before that, we've done a, a, a huge big event along with the guy who run Boxing Scotland, a guy called Richard Thomas, who's basically took the sport and dragged it with scuff the neck up to the year 2015 at the time, mm -hmm. yeah. 13, sorry. And we um, we done Prince Street Gardens and we sold it there about 3,500 people. So I put in my promotional came on, because that was a club promoter, I never mentioned mm -hmm. that earlier. I'd done all the clubs events and stuff like that and learned how to promote, mm -hmm. learned how to get out there and community. Where did you learn all that, Brad? Because oh, your, just... your mind's sharp. Like I say, before we, were, before we started, we were talking and the things... The ideas you've got for the future and the things you set up, it's, it's run smooth, it's run, and it's not just small scale events. Oh, it's, it's hard work you need to put up. If anybody, yeah. it's all about hard work. But where did that come from, the organisation skills? Then, well, I didn't organise Scotland's biggest gang, probably. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> <laughs> there you go, then. there you go, there's your answer. <laughs> <laughs> but then it must, but to, oh, today, that at such a young age, you must have had that. Like I say, you're very, no, no, you're very sharp. Yes, yeah, so I've always been, people have always called me a hyperactive child. Mm -hmm. And I still am, and to this day I'm still a thousand miles an hour, yeah? It's what I do, yeah? It's like I work today, like today I'm 60 hour a day, mate. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? It's what I do. And again, back to that, that's probably because I said that to you, I spent six years in my bed, mate. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm in a job, James. Mm -hmm. I'm in work, mate. I've always done things for myself. And chasing financial orientation has never been my thing. I'm scared to do that. I went and it's still work. Um, I'm a bankrupt anyway, I'll come to that just now. So um, we... Um, Putting on these large scale events, it created opportunities and I had a vision for it, yeah. So went to Prince Street Gardens, done that, and then it just was six years down the line. So then over the it's been quite transformational for me, by the way, because as I was doing that and stuff, it was very good to do and it's very I enjoyed it and stuff. Rewarding. Like it was rewarding because you're putting on huge events and you're entertaining people and it's good. The money that came out of it, I then opened up other gyms. So what I done was when they found the money it came, I set up a register charity called ABA Limited, mm -hmm. along with um two very, very good um friends who are um, big businessmen in Edinburgh, they do put in there, so they've started to guide me a little bit, yeah? And we opened up a register charity to engage with people, to basically engage with kids and create opportunities. So we opened up 10 or 12 boxing gyms in the country. And a partner in Glasgow, actually, at the time, a guy called Sam Kinnock, who does say... Uh, oh, Sam, uh, I... Uh, Sam... AMG... AMG... Kinnock Promotions. MGM. So we were doing really well, we opened up an alternative amateur association against both um, and Paralympics for Boxing Scotland. But Sam went and got the, the hook in his mouth from the guys from MTK. He got offered a professional deal, I wanted to go into professional boxing, mm -hmm. which I've already said, did they meet my remit to what I want to do, yeah? And if people wanted to do that, so Sam fucked off and went with MTK, and I just stayed doing what I was doing, which was engaging with kids and mm -hmm. creating opportunities for them. So, and that's where I've been. So, but transformationally wise, after we've done the big events, over the last four years, just after like we've done the, still doing the usher halls, and then got involved in sort of charity stuff for some reason, I don't know why, yeah? So I've been four years now creating again stuff, Register charities, pal, and what we're doing is ours is a small charity, it's all volunteer, not one person takes any money for it, mm -hmm. period. That's a charity. Which is brilliant because when all these big charities can take. That's right. Yeah. And what we've done is opened up boxing gymnasiums and communities for kids to train in. 
So we've done about four, four of them in Edinburgh, we've done about 12 up in the country. And that was the vision to do that, to engage with kids. Not we find boxers. A boxing gymnasium should be about, about for everybody, for the whole community to go in. And I think most of them are, in general. Except a lot of them are still running the gear towards the trainers want to find the big enough diamond that they can polish aye, up. Aye, aye. Make money for Exactly. And so I'm sort of against them. If that's what people want to do, that's fine. I suppose that's how you create world champions, eh? Yeah. Aye. So we went to, um, from there we went just, we were going from strength to strength and I got involved in food banks and stuff. They've got a, a good partner in Edinburgh called Jim Slaven. And the two of us decided that there was an opportunity to open them and engage more directly, not just through boxing, but through other things, football and stuff. Mm -hmm. So we opened, we formed, uh, the two of us co-founded an organisation called Help Hands. That's about four years Which ago. is amazing. You sent me the Facebook link and the stuff yeah, that you're so, doing on that with the young boys. So Help Hands operates under the register charity. It's an initiative for that. And what that is, it's an all-volunteer group which is set up to engage with local communities, pal. Mm -hmm. All right, marginalised. And how can people else get involved? What's this? What's the social media for that as well, for Facebook and stuff? And just check it out. It's, it's called Helping Hands Edinburgh. Right. What it is, we, over the last four years, we've um, collectively we've done organised the biggest food banks in Edinburgh. We do like 30 tonne collections just to rival the Celtic ones. So you know, we saw that by getting working class people to look out and donate to their own communities. Mm -hmm. That's time. So we've done that for about three years and it was hugely successful. We then moved into doing um, initiatives, yeah, sport initiatives where we provided free football training. Um, we had your man Andy McLaren and stuff like that. Andy's brilliant. He guided us. He's doing very similar work mm. in Glasgow. Aye. So we looked at his model and stuff as we were doing it. We took some bits from that. But again, it wasn't to find football players. What we actually done was very unique. Yeah, And we actually got professional football players in. Like Paul Kane, Mickey Weir, Alan McLaren and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and we got them to, um, to come in and give structured coaching for mm. free. So we went into the communities, reclaimed the local parks. Yeah. Cleared on a dog shuttle from put signs and stuff up, talk to the people in the area. Mm -hmm. This is your park, it's where you are. Because there's no services there. Mm -hmm. The community centre is kind of getting it because you need money to get it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you want to play football, you've got to play the subs. So there's a, a whole wealthy talent out there and young kids that are being marginalised and alienated for access and free football. Mm -hmm. You know? I know it's Alan um, and he's been harking on it about through there and his, his operation is huge. So what we've done was our first year, which is three years ago. We um, went into the communities with six of them and gave free football coaching. We done this with about 4,000 kids. Yeah. For the last We done it for 12 weeks and then at the end of it, we done a festival of football in Edinburgh. So we took all the kids, all the communities in Edinburgh mm -hmm. and we brought them into the city centre. There was like 600 kids there. And we, gave, we had Scott Brown there, we had um, Lee Griffiths, we had um, Kenny Miller, we had John McGann, we had all the Hibs team, Hearts team, stuff mm -hmm. like that, come in to inspire the kids. They say to them, you belong here. So, but I've always, through the boxing gym, days, that's what I've always been. I run that boxing gym because it, it gives something to kids. Mm -hmm. And it gives something, not just to kids, but we touch on the cellar, to adults as well. Mm -hmm. If you're in a gym, whether it's a boxing gym or a karate gym or whether you're at the gym, yeah, training, physical exercise as a human being of course. will stimulate you. Of course. It'll, it'll clear you up, it'll sort of the talks in your fixed body. Depression, and it gets, fear, fixed right. depression. And that's, I don't need to shout about that, but a lot of people that do come to the gym and stuff, I do that, are people that are needing some mm -hmm. of that in their life. And I'm there to inspire and you. That's what you're providing, like I say, when you are exercising, whether it's boxing, football, it releases serotonin, exactly. endorphins, dopamine. This is the stuff that fights depression. This is the stuff that makes you feel good. But it only lasts for a few hours and then it when goes away. Dip, exactly. It has a dip again. So this is why. Your body starts claiming it. Aye, I know, because it's, it. it's the natural buzzes. So when somebody gets that buzz, that's why a lot of people turn to drinking drugs because it gives them that buzz right. where they feel important. But all the stuff you're doing for the kids, mate, I take my hat off to you because, like I say, the life you've came through and, and what you've done it's led you to the path you are now and this isn't just one or two boys this is hundreds and thousands of people are coming through yours to, to do what you're doing well the gyms do that and it's great with us so and then for the last three years i've been i've been entrenched in this putting on initiatives for kids this year we went into i mean really remarkably this year along with boxing scotland social bite and um we went into an urban welsh yeah mm -hmm. who, are, who are inspired to get behind us and put a bit of money into it yeah Quite hard to get money to Irvine, by the way. So <laughs> we went into Edinburgh. And what I've done was an idea to take Hollywood and to create Hollywood and all the areas in Edinburgh that don't have boxing gyms. Because I believe that a boxing gym is a place that, that should be community led, and it's about the it's a space for people to go to. It doesn't matter whether they can box. It's about the physical side and the mental side and applying yourself. We touched mm -hmm. on that. So I went and this year opened up twelve boxing gyms in Edinburgh. So I opened up a boxing gym in the communities in Muir, and spout and. Um, so that a deprived areas? Or, well, 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 not, yeah, I know you know. They're not, they're not, they're not, they're not, they're marginalised in the mm -hmm. sense that you know the the, the the kind of people that live there are on the economics, you know, at the bottom half, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And it's like there's no lot for kids to do. That's that. So I picked the areas and I picked twelve of them. It was a huge project, and I went and I took a boxing gym to all these community centres. 
So for six weeks, we engaged with like 6,000 kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We it's, boxed it's phenomenal numbers. And that was helping hands that done that. So we went there and also had free, along with the Scottish government, at one point we, had, we were giving kids access to free food and water and stuff like that on the sessions as well. Food. That's brilliant. So, do you, do you, are you getting any backing for anybody, Brad? No, we, we, I, I believe that it's a, even though we've got a registered charity, which is Oscar led. I How can it. people, what's the charities? Nah, we didn't want anything. See, this is. No, no, but for people to take a look and. Well, just Edward Helping Hands, that's it. And mm -hmm. the other one's AB Limited, which is its, uh, which is its parent, yeah. It's mm -hmm. like, but I didn't believe it's the, the way the charities part that you should be asking the public for anything, mate, mm -hmm. which brings us nicely to that shit. Yeah. So for the last four years, just to summarise again, I've been sort of embroiled and entrenched in this poverty industry. And this year, James, I've turned away from that, mate, yeah. Turned away from that because myself and our co founder and our steering group. We realised that what we were doing was, even though we're doing good with food banks and we're doing good, quite this year as well, I helped Social Bank, as you know. Yeah. Aye, Josh, let me shout out to him for big okay. things. Yeah, so we've we, um, we done that as well. But I became aware to us that we're just like them. How does the general public, when they see me organising a food bank, differentiate between me and these people that are businesses living off poverty outside supermarkets, asking you to buy through the supermarket to donate? Supermarkets fucking love it. Buy our food, but give it to them. Mm -hmm. It's like... These big organised charity businesses, Paul, it was hard for the public to recognise what we were doing is different from what they were doing because none of us take money, we're not a business and we're just we're trying to help our people in our community that need it, yes? These businesses that are set up, all of them, charities in general, there's two types of charity. One is a charity, there's somebody out there on the front line doing good. It's a small operation, probably going to get any funding and they need a wee bit of help, yeah, in the community. And there's other ones who are conglomerate businesses, yes, who... Are set are billionaire companies that are set up with the sole purpose to beg the public for their money so they can as ascertain what they do with it. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, take half a million pound running costs for it. So, you know, we decided as helping hands it was time for us to get out of the poverty industry. So this year, in our fifth year, we didn't do the food bank at Easter Road, which collects 30 tonnes. And the reason why that is, is food banks, people have got to understand. Yes, there's a need for them, but the Trussell Trust and all these other companies are set up hand in hand with Oscar registration as a charity, when the government stemming, because if you've got the public donating to that, then the government didn't have to do it. Mm -hmm. It's a systemic problem, people being hungry, yes? All these people have fell through the cracks in the same way, way homelessness, or the same way anything like that, yeah? And it's like systemic problems need solved by the government. They don't need to, it's wrong and immoral that it should be solved by the public. Mm -hmm. You've been fooled, you pay your tax, mm -hmm. and now you're getting asked to donate to a heart foundation, cancer research, just anybody that's going to give money to any of these companies, have a look at where your money's going. Aye. And don't drop it in a bag. Take control and ownership of what you're doing and give it to the frontline services. Don't give it to these big bastard business companies that have got half a million pound companies or CEO, half a million running costs, half a million pound running costs, and CEOs on 700 grand and stuff like that. And it's and it's and that's the thing. That the, the hook is, is that they think you're stupid. They think you'll not look at that and see that you're just paying all their wages. Now again, just to clarify, there is good charities out there. There's many good charities out there doing good work. Mm -hmm. But it's wrong to have companies set up solely to just ask the public for money. Mm -hmm. Because you've already paid your tax. The government aren't hand in hand with these people. While you keep paying for it, they'll, the government will not pay for it. And there's a big message in that. There. Yeah, big so, which leads us nicely to that, that after doing James Day, the getting out of the food stuff, we've also decided like this year alone, James, yeah, the helping hands, we were involved in a bike initiative where we had like we organised along with our partners like three hundred bikes to the kids in the community so they get up and get fit and healthy on it. We organised some food distribution which we didn't want to do but we had to because we from the success of last year we still had people wanting to come and give us food. But we've made it clear now that we're not involved in that Hibernian Football Club who we worked in partnership with, they've been made aware of that and it's due to them to take ownership of what they're doing and decide to that. Think about food when you donate food. As I, wanted, I was being disingenuous, yeah, because my experiences in the food bank with my, part, my partner, Jim, is that we were giving the food to these food banks and all they were doing at Christmas time, which is when most people would donate. So we were going out there and getting 30 tonne of food given to us. But that food, James, was going on in the big truck and getting stored up on a big pallet. And the people at Christmas time and New Year weren't even getting that food. How? Because you need a ticket, James. You need a ticket. You've got to be referred to a food bank, mate. What? You've got to be referred to a food bank. So when... So if you're starving and fucking you potentially some, dying, you need a ticket to go and get if food. If you've got two wee bairns who are starving in the house as well, you're not going to go to the social worker yet and say, I can't feed my bairns. Because mm -hmm. now you've got social work involvement. So there's a whole 
People, people, people that have got jobs, pal, they can't feed themselves. I had two That's jobs, aye. Exactly. When I was doing the soup kitchens and the food bank, uh, the soup kitchens in the tune when I was doing my documentary, there's people that were in the soup kitchens that had two jobs that were struggling to pay their rent, couldn't there you go. food. So you've got, and, this is, and the government's got a stranglehold on that because you have to be referred, you have to have a, a doctor or a professional that's like in social work or something like that that's going to refer you to it, yeah? Now, a lot of people didn't want to engage in the people because they didn't want them involved in their life because they could lose their kids or lose mm. their family or you've got an abusive husband or what's the situation going on or an abusive wife. Aye. Just keep that politically okay. correct. Yeah. Aye, okay. So, but the, um, so what happens with food, we were given over 30 to a year, but that was the getting out of the year and then we found out that this is along with the organisation we were dealing with, but you need a ticket to go there. And when you went there, James, you got a bag of food that looked like that. Yeah, it's what Not it was feed. So what we done last year is myself and the other members of the steering group of our we divided up the food that we collected and we took it to the frontline services. We took it to the community centres. Yeah, so we gave half, it was 30, 27 done it, mate. Mm -hmm. We split up, got the vans, I organised all that stuff along with my partner, Jim, yeah, and we, we distributed it to all the community centres which are frontline, who are working with frontline people who are dealing with it. And that, and the real the, heroes in my eyes. Well, you know, the thing is, it's a bit of a thing like that, but it's something that you have to accept. And the, the front lines right now are community centres which are council run, unfortunately, mm -hmm. right? But the people in there are doing a lot of good, but they are the front line because if they weren't there, they'd be fuck all there. They bodies everywhere as well. Yeah, exactly. So we've done that last year. We just decided this year that by us doing the food bank and it became so successful in the sense of the amount of food that we collected, which is never enough, but they, we were just the same as them. Mm -hmm. People, these people standing outside supermarkets saying, it's a con, no money. It's like, charity's got to, James, it's been 40 years in the making, mate. Charity businesses are only 40 years in the making. Since when did we need fucking billionaire companies to set themselves up in the middle to beg us for money mm -hmm. to give to them so they can decide what they are? Just bypass them and give it directly. Mm -hmm. You want to help somebody, go to your local community and say, and ask them what they need. Mm -hmm. yeah? Give it to people directly, give it to your neighbour. Where's this? community aspect where we're now, we don't even fucking talk to our neighbours. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? It's a break doing society in that way. There is a better way, Paul. The better way is to cut out the big businesses, which leads us to where I am now, James, yeah? For this, this year, I mean, that's just six months. I've done a bike initiative, done some food stuff like that there, market to the box stuff like that there. I mean, we've got projects lined up for next year we're going to do, which again is all going to be about engaging with kids. This year we're going to roll out free football, boxing, judo, biking, rock climbing and athletics. All right. unbelievable. So we're going to roll that out and give opportunities to all the kids in Edinburgh to take part in that for free. Yeah, it's a big, it's a big, big thing. It's a big, big thing. How can people get involved and try and help you? But again, that. again, back to that, we didn't want to ask the public. What I'll do is I'm we'll go to businesses that would perhaps in the past, for, until I've spoke to them, mm -hmm. we'd just be writing checks and dropping them into big charities. Mm -hmm. well, you're dropping that money into big charities. So that money into did. somebody's pocket. Got, well, first it goes into somebody's pocket. And again, just to be clear, there might be people here that are working for a charity. Yeah, she's doing a good job, it's great. But there's too many out there, pal, we see now. You know, we've been speaking about it for a number of years, but this year I took a bit of action on it, pal. Mm -hmm. This year, which leads to where I am now. So we're still doing the helping hands in this year. So I will still continue to do the box stuff. We've got big plans for the box this year. I want my box in Scotland to put on large scale events and create opportunities for kids to participate in boxing. Yeah. But I'll be doing the separate initiative with helping hands to do football, boxing, do you know, and what we're going to do is bust these kids into all these different places. So I've got a transport network. He doesn't know that he's doing it yet, so I'll not mention him. <laughs> but we've got, um, and we're going to, we're going to taxi these kids in so that they can have different nights in each place and create opportunities for our marginalised kids in the areas of Edinburgh who get fuck all. And they get nothing because just this is life. Eh? They've got parents that are maybe working who can't make ends meet. How are they going to give their kid four or five quid or six quid mm -hmm. or pay the juice to go to a football thing? They can't do that. So that's where I am. This is where I am now. This is where rebrands ended up. If they're everything in the past and whatever it is and the people have a shit and go to crack on you. Know? But it doesn't affect me. Well, that's what I'm I'll, saying. I'll stay on uh, the line, Paul. For I'm anybody on. to try and tarnish your, your name or reputation, no matter what the fuck you've done 10, 20 years ago. 20 years ago. 25 years ago. It's, it's, it's embarrassing if, if you ask me well, because but, what you're doing is with the Waynes, I don't see anybody else making these moves. These aren't just one or two kids, these are thousands of people. Also with the food banks, like I say, when you talk there, you can see your passion, you can feel it because you know the system we've got is fucking wrong, let's face it, it's flawed, it's all bullshit. And for anybody listening, watching, like I say, get into this Facebook page, the things they're doing is, is phenomenal. Get as much help, like, I know you don't want help, but other people can get involved and other people can realise it's genuine how you want to help other people in life. In my helping hands, that's like, all you need to do is, all anybody needs to do is, is just look back to your old community and put back in there. Mm -hmm. And if we create that thing, we will no need these big companies mm -hmm. coming and begging us for money. Mm -hmm. Which brings me to where I am right now because I have 
over the last, I took action over it this year, James, last year we, um, we I basically took, so there's a chap in Glasgow called Andy Smiley, a lot of people will know him, big Andy Smiley, he's got scaffolding. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Andy last year, the thing called the Emily, Emily Smiley Foundation, and he got in touch with me and he had about 20 grams worth of toys. He had seven, he bought all toys last year for a part of this. And he said, Brian, I've got some toys, can you distribute them in Edinburgh? Because we've done a big toy distribution thing as well. And while doing that, I came across this Cash for Kids people who are in Glasgow, yeah, they're on Radio Clyde, and they're in Edinburgh. And I took the toys up there to them because I had all these wee baby rattles left. And while I was up there, I gave them these toys and they had a warehouse, a warehouse, I'm saying, full of toys right up to the girls, thousands of toys. It was the 19th of December. So they collected all these toys, which was clear to me, yeah, at that time, that they were never going to distribute them. So I said to the woman, I've got four vans here on the road because I was doing a toy and bike initiative, yeah? We gave out thousands of toys and bikes and stuff like that. And we get funders to that. We didn't ask the public for it. It's wrong to ask the public for it. You better find a funder, a businessman who's got, who's got a, 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 maybe a cathartic soul like myself, yeah? To put in and wants to do good. So and there was thousands of toys and it just was confusing. So we went and um, had a wee look. And then later that day, I heard on the radio, this um, Radio Forth that was, and it's, it's the same as in Glasgow and the same in Aberdeen and all over, yeah? And I heard, well, we've not got enough um, baby toys and we've not got enough um, for 14-year-olds. Can you donate money? Five and ten pounds. So they're on the radio on the 20th of December asking for money, right up to the 24th of December, but they've got a warehouse full of toys. Right? So it became strange. I was thinking, this is strange. I'd experienced them about the year before with another wee boy, but I'll not get into that just now. So therefore, I looked and I went to their bins. So they have all these collection bins and points. All the bins were overflowing with toys, James. So I thought, they're on the radio asking for money. They've got a warehouse full of toys and they've got collection bins that are unemptied. And it's now the 21st of December. So we monitored them right up to the 25th of December, 25th, 24th of December. They were still asking for money. So then later on that year, once I had Christmas and over, we'd done a bit of investigation of them. They're an organisation called Bauer Media. Bauer Media are one of the biggest um, media companies in Europe. They've got TV channels, they've got they all the radios, but practically they own 22 radio stations around the country, James. And they're 22 radio stations that they own. Yeah, it's, in Edinburgh, it's 4th 1. In Glasgow, it's Clyde, yeah. Then they've got Aberdeen 1, stuff like that. And they do a thing called Cash for Kids. So you've got a billionaire company who use their apparatus, yes, which is their radio stations, who set up a charity called Cash for Kids. And they ask for cash. Now, it should be clear to everybody, it's in the fucking name, eh? Cash for kids. Why not? Kids. Toys for kids. Why not? Help for kids. And what they do is, is they use their apparatus to beg the public for money. Now, I got involved with it, so this year, because I'm a little proactive guy, along with a, a group called the Toy Box Working Group, Helping Hands, and a young boy called Cody McManus, yeah? Who had an experience of you before. We sat around collaborating together and having a wee run at them, yeah? To try and educate the public that this is a billionaire company using its apparatus, the radio waves, to beg the public for money. Now, Bauer Media do not put one penny into that charity. The charity is solely set up to beg you for money. Now, they then set themselves up and take reflective glory for that as if they've done something. They've not done anything. They've just collected your money. Now, what transpired as well, James, they didn't have any infrastructure. So when they get the toys for the bins, I mean, they didn't have one van or one driver to collect that. What they do is that they make the, their partners in the place that have them deliver it themselves. And then the toys, as they get collected, they claim to dish the, the marginalised kids get them. Yes, they do, marginalised kids do get them. But it needs to be a person that comes and collects the toys. Mm -hmm. So they've got a system set up with the infrastructure that doesn't cost anything, but a half a million pound running cost on their staff. That's what it is. So they're taking 3.5 million pound in Edinburgh, and a half a million pound that goes to them for the apparatus they've already got. And they charge for the radio ads. They're a disingenuous organisation, and I had a, a year of negotiation with them to try and say, you need to put vans on mm -hmm. because that way, when you've, if you've got vans, you'll not have a warehouse full of toys. Mm -hmm. Simple, simple equation. Warehouse full of toys, yes. Nay vans, nay distribution. All the idea is get vans of distribution and I can process my applications. It's a disingenuous organisation. It's set up to use kids in poverty to facilitate their own self and to benefit themselves. That's it. Now, I've came out, not just here, James, but I've been publicly mm -hmm. told of that in newspapers and I've also put um, videos and videography out there calling them for what they are. They're a disingenuous organisation doing that to benefit themselves. They're offsetting their staff costs, yes, which I believe is about £10 million over the whole of the UK. This is, this is not in Edinburgh. This is in Glasgow. This is in Aberdeen. This is in Dundee. This is anywhere there is, they have the fourth, the, anywhere they have their brand and franchise, right, which is cash for kids. Yes, 80% of the money goes to where it's meant to go because they're audited and stuff like that. They keep shouting that. 
That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the fact that you just use the public while you do nothing. You use their time and energy, their volunteer. And if you volunteer to them, you're not liking what I'm saying. You're thinking, no, that's wrong. I've done that. Listen to yourself. You've done it. No name. They just use us. They think we're all fools. They think we're all second-class citizens, James. That when is that a good idea that a billionaire company sets up like that and asks the public... Where do the toys go, then? The toys stay until the next year. And then they give them out during the year. But wait there. The charity regulator clearly says, if you ask, if I'm saying to you, James, give me that ball and I'll give it to a kid at Christmas time, yeah? If I leave it in a warehouse, I've not done my job, have I? Mm -hmm. So there's wains without toys as well? Thousands of wains without toys. Well, they are a PR company, Paul. That's a, now, I've came out publicly and told them I'll call them again. They're a bunch of cowards. That's what they are. Because mm -hmm. I've tried to get them into a court, James. And why I want them into a court is because then I can rip apart the flimsy, disingenuous model. But they've not done it. What they've done is a very quite acute PR campaign to smother out. They put a tin hat on it. They didn't want anybody in Aberdeen, anybody in Glasgow, questioning what actually happens. There's no infrastructure. You cannot collect a million pounds worth of toys yeah, and money and not have a distribution network. But they can, because they get the idiot public to come and donate their time with their cars and stuff like that to them. Can he do that? So it's wrong. It's, it's morally wrong. They keep saying, um, we'll go to the charity regular, go to Oscar, I'll go to some... I mean, get fucked, you know what I mean? They're, they're these people are saying... So you're trying you. to take it to court? Well, I've done, well, they're not keeping it to court. I've called them cowards that many times, they're not, they're not there. Now, I know it's quite uncomfortable for like, a wee guy like me from the streets to actually say to a big conglomerate company like that. The guy lives in Edinburgh, James, right? And basically, I text him, I say to the guy, I'm outside the fourth one awards, yeah? It's another moneymaker for Bill and Media, yeah? Um, come and see me. He went to the police, James. Mm -hmm. Went to the police and said he felt friend. It's a guy called Graham Bryce, yeah, who's the head, an Edinburgh boy, who should have some kind of feeling and emotive content to regards to the communities of Edinburgh. I'm telling you that the toys, yes, do not get to the kids that they should get. Others have got a level, a playing field, where they give it 20,000 to these people at 50 quid each and it meets their numbers, yeah. They are charging half a million pounds to do that. I inspire and ask the public to no longer donate to charities like that. Then they give to these big charities. Give to you want to help someday, miss out the middle, man. They're, 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 these are basically cash for kids who take your money. They didn't buy any toys with it. They collected over £350,000 last year and they spent £86,000 on that on toys. Now, why are they asking for your money if they didn't spend that money on toys? What they'll tell you is, we give it out during the year. Well, hold on a second. It's Christmas time. It's called cash for kids. Christmas and Christmas. Give it out at Christmas. So don't do that, James. But that's it. Mm -hmm. So and for then, people to educate themselves on who they're donating to. Not just cash for kids, all charities, guys. Mm. You've got to be looking now. You see, if you want to do, there's too many businesses out there that people are set up that are making money off kids living in fucking poverty, mate. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? It's not a business, guys. And it's funny because it's the ones who donate money, it's the ones who give money, have not really got much money themselves. 100%. You're coming out and saying supermarkets, and it's like, it's, then you get out. if you want to help somebody, help your next door neighbour. Mm -hmm. Get to them, or go to the local community mm -hmm. centre and give it in there. Because that's the focal points where people are gathering and that thing. Mm -hmm. And it is council running. The council should be there as well. But unfortunately, they are there. And if people want to help each other, it's time to get back to that. We start looking left and right, mate. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? And that's it. Now, the projection for me going forward next year, I'm, I'm going into the Toy Box Working Group. I just got funding. And it looks like that they're going to run an alternative toy campaign next year. So they're going to put 10 vans on mm -hmm. Edinburgh streets. Mm -hmm. And they've already got 20 schools involved and 10 community centres. And what we're going to do is... Because this thing about, like, if you want toys, you have to go and collect them. What that does, James, is it clips it. Because social workers kind of use their, kind of use a work vehicle to go and get them. Mm -hmm. You've got to use their own car, so that's after hours. So all the kids that should be getting the toys, are they getting them? And all cash for kids are getting it is just a masterful PR campaign to say, look at our accounts, look at what you do. Well, unfortunately, the accounts fall down because when you collect over three or four hundred thousand pounds and you only spend eighty six thousand pounds yet, you're failing. When you have a warehouse full of toys, you're failing. That's it. You need to put a distribution mm -hmm. network on. Now, I offered them to do that and said, you need to put a distribution network on. And all they done, James, is they dug their heels and went, what middle-class millionaires do, right? And they think that, that this is not going to affect them. Well, it is going to affect them because the Toy Box Work Group this year will put on an alternative to make sure that kids in the communities get toys delivered to them. Not have to go and queue like second-class citizens and sort all their mm -hmm. Yeah? All right? So, and they're going to do it for free. Uh -huh. So they'll put on 10 vans, they've already got a warehouse and they've got funding for a man in Dubai who thinks it's a great idea, yeah, and just does they like the way that Bauer Media use their, use their, wealth, their wealth and their size, yeah? I mean, this is a huge billionaire company, mate. And again, they put not one penny in, so your money goes to paying half a million quid off your wages mm -hmm. every year for them to distribute your gifts. No, but like I say, if the work you're doing, Brad, is unbelievable, and, and like I say, you're a leader now amongst the men who's shown how it should be done. 6,000 wains, 
all these thousands of wings that are coming through with the Facebook. What's the sorry, helping hands, helping hands, help yeah. hands, check it out Edinburgh, they're doing phenomenal things. Again, for coming on today, I appreciate that. But before we go, train spotting two. Oh, yes, how did it go? Well, I've been actually been offered another part a big film actually. <laughs> train spotting two was just an opportunity through uh -huh. Irvin Welsh, the pal, pal of mine, yeah, the pal of what people went in. But I came up to um, came up to the gymnasium at the time with Danny Boyle, just to let you know the story. I was originally written in to do with the guy with the pads. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's what I do every day, Jim. Like the day I'll do mm -hmm. 200 rounds of pads, yeah, helping kids and, and, and people come into the gym. And then they just, he, Danny Boyle just sprung on me. He, um, I done a thing called Pads for Charity, you know that? I'm a aye, aye, Guinness aye. World Record aye. told there. I done a Guinness World Record table, mm -hmm. done 24 hours of pads, right round. And, and they came to that. So from that, they um, they offered me an audition for a part and I had mm -hmm. to go on. It's not the first time I've been in a forest for some days, so <laughs> <laughs> it's actually not that. As you probably know, I, I played it wrong, eh? uh -huh. I lost the part. Mm -hmm. And then I said to Danny Boyle, I done a book launch for Urban Welsh, and I said to him, um, I went and done that wrong. Can I re can I come and do mm -hmm. it? He went, he went, I did it, I'll send me a showreel. So I made up a showreel and mm -hmm. I made up a showreel and sent it. Trains point two, that's unbelievable. What about his films in Scotland? You should be proud of it. I'm not sure about my daughter's got to watch about <laughs> narrative content, you know what I mean? And that was my only concern. I didn't want, I've got my daughter, so I didn't want to glamorise any stuff. Of like course, that. but. But you're playing a character and Of course, and it's acting. And they offered me, uh, right at the time, uh, a big agency in London, mm -hmm. I won't mention them, they said to me, come down, we'll put you on a book. Mm -hmm. But all they were ever going to do was cast type me. Uh -huh. I was just going to be the big bad Scottish guy, correct? Of course, but then it's the I still had that later say for what you've came through, Brad, to everything you're achieving now, blockbuster film, doing all your stuff for charity, doing all your stuff for the Waynes. I think it's phenomenal, mate. And for coming on today and taking your time and, and saying what you've got to say, I appreciate it. And I wish you nothing but the best for the future, Brad. Thank you very much. Listen, mate, I really appreciate that. Thank you, likewise. Yeah. Love Hair and Beauty Salon, based in Springburn, offers a full range of hair and beauty treatments from nail enhancements, derma planning, lash lifts, henna brows and lashes, right through to the full colour and cut beauty work hair extensions. They also have the resident makeup artist Megan to complete the full package. You can visit them on social media on Instagram, Love Hair and Beauty 09 and Facebook, Love Hair and Beauty Glasgow. You can also make a telephone call to book an appointment at 0141 258-2070 AM Events are specialists in party wedding and event planning management. They offer services from full event planning and management right down to the standalone venue dressing. AM Events strive for 100% customer satisfaction every time from email updates and how about the planning is going, managing the day of the event. They will support you the whole way through. So for more information to make a booking, Pop down to their showroom at Unit 2, Foundry Street, Atlas Industrial Estate in Glasgow. Their phone number is 0141 237 3020. So pop along or else their social media pages are on Facebook, AM Events and also Instagram at amevents.glasgow. Collins Morgan have assisted thousands of Scottish residents with financial difficulty. So if you are struggling to keep up with the increase in cost living along with managing debt, then message Collins Morgan on Facebook for free, friendly and regulated advice on the solutions available for you.